you remember last show when I wondered, now what are the chances that Cameron Archer comes back and scores against his old side? I should have taken that bet. And I'm not hearing any of this typical Villa stuff. That's for the past. You knew. Chris Wilder was going to have Sheffield United set up very disciplined and hard to break down and generally irritating. So now the Villa Park winning streak becomes the Villa Park unbeaten streak. And you know, the Blades hadn't won at Villa Park since 1966, and we were about 10 minutes away from seeing that streak end. And who came to our rescue again? Whew, to help me unpack these issues and a lot more frankly around the club is this i absolutely love this right now i'm not a huge fan of pd scotches but this <whistles> let's unpack aston villa one sheffield united one I'm not trying to avoid talking about the Sheffield United match here, but there was a significant piece of news dropped in midweek when Chris Heck revealed that Villa is putting a pause on the North Stand redevelopment project, keeping in mind the first design was approved by council. Then they changed the plans and it was approved again. And this is only a couple of days before a pretty important component to the whole thing. The Witten Station proposal was supposedly pushed forward, whatever that means. There's something not right here. And I could see the benefits, obviously, of upsizing, upgrading, and improving the North Stand. It's outdated, obviously. I could also see how, at a time when we're doing very well at Villa Park, it would be perhaps not a benefit to lose that inventory, especially when we're in the mix for Touchwood Champions League football. Is it possible that the club is thinking bigger and wider right now and putting all the options on the table. Euro 2028 is a catalyst for opportunity to improve some grounds, but it's all kind of chicken and egg. And I just wonder if it's really the be all and end all for Villa or Villa Park. When you think about it, you need a minimum capacity to host those games, 50,000 seats. But in order to add those seats, you'd have to drastically improve the transportation infrastructure around the ground, which you'll only get if you get the euros, which require more seats, which require, do you know what I mean? So I just wonder if Villa is putting the brakes on this right now until they get more concrete commitments from the relevant transit authorities or city council bureaucracies that they have, or is it possible that they are thinking about maybe building an entirely new stadium? I'm telling you, this announcement that we were putting a pause on our redevelopment was seismic for me, and somehow not coincidental timing wise it's a way bigger issue than even the game on friday if you're asking me because like many people i am a staunch remainer of villa park the thought of leaving is hard for me to accept because what you lose is the human karma of 130 or so years of great grandparents taking grandparents taking parents taking grandkids and you feel that when you're there but this cat named Fabrizio Romano goes on X and puts out these AI generated renderings of a Victorian era architecture inspired brand spanking new villa park and I have to admit something inside me stirred a little bit because we don't know what we don't know we can't even imagine what that might look like until somebody comes along and shows us the possibilities. And you know, our footballing forefathers, when they founded these clubs, they had no inclination whatsoever of future growth or logistics or access. And that's what makes English football so beautiful. The randomness of some of these grounds being in neighborhoods that they have absolutely no business being in. But for me, that's part of what makes it magic. 
And they had crowds back then that dwarfed the crowds that we're getting now. And none of those people grumbled about long train station queues or lack of parking. Chris Heck's job is to do whatever he can to grow and improve Aston Villa Football Club as a commercial entity and as a brand. And he's also responsible for presenting to Nassif Sawiris and Wes Edens the best options in order to do that. So there is no way that a guy like that will have not had the blank page discussion. And the blank page discussion is if you had a blank page and you could completely reimagine Aston Villa and its home venue, would you still put it at where it's located today? Keeping in mind that history is a very important component in football, especially in England. I'm not sure they would, given the Witten and Aston Station situations, because it's going to limit your growth. If you could, however, build a Victorian-era cathedral, borrowing elements and details from past grandstands and facades, and incorporate them all together in a 60,000-seat ground with all the beautiful antiquities, but also creature comforts that they do so well in the United States with Major League Baseball, who build those kinds of stadia all the time. And imagine if you could have a train station that actually is right inside the stadium. Are you kidding me that you wouldn't at least explore that possibility? And on top of that, you have the recent Ateros V-Sport joint venture announcement, which significantly increases our capitalization, enabling us to go and take on some kind of a mega project like, oh, I don't know, say a $1 billion new stadium build like a lot of clubs have undertaken. I've never considered or even wanted to consider a move away from Villa Park. You know how I am. But I think we'd be naive to think that our hierarchy isn't exploring all sorts of options to do what is best for all of us to maybe one day turn us into a super club. Not a super league club, a super club. Now on to the game. And of course, I had to chuckle that the two home fixtures prior to this one were against the top two teams in the league in Manchester City and Arsenal, and we won them both. But when the bottom team in the Premier League comes around, we have to settle for a draw. But that, my friend, is football. And that's the Premier League. And that's why it's the greatest league in the world. And I'm sure in a perfect world, Unai Emery would have preferred to not make four changes heading into this game because I feel like he loves continuity, but his hand was forced somewhat with the suspension to Bubakar Kamara and the injuries to Pau Torres and Yuri Tielemans. Not an excuse, just not necessarily ideal. Welcome officially to the Holy Trinity Show, where I review the three key issues or moments that defined Villa 1, Sheffield United 1, and Samir Gaby, our senior correspondent, was on hand with camera rolling to capture the festive event. Not as festive as his Christmas jumper, mind you, but the key numbers were once again not representative of the outcome. And unfortunately, being Aston Villa right now means you are going to have to face a lot of games like this with 10 bodies behind the ball and successful dribbles. This blows me away. We're dominated by the Blades. And this is where, even with Diaby and Bailey, Villa was so rarely able to beat that first man on the dribble. And I think this is something that needs to probably be addressed with recruitment. Positive issue, which may have ramifications for Villa, but the way the festive fixtures worked out this year. I mean, they played Sheffield United on Friday the 22nd, four days until Boxing Day, that's Tuesday at Old Trafford, and then another four days before the visit of Burnley, on the 30th, not to mention that the players will basically be able to celebrate Christmas Eve with their families for sure. A lot of them do. And even Christmas morning, they'll probably train on both of those days. But still, that's manageable. I remember in the past having sometimes just two days between matches during the festive period. Minor issue and one that causes me zero angst whatsoever. But there were a couple of examples in that game that prove that Jacob Ramsey is still 
trying to find his feet and get back up to speed in the Premier League after the lengthy injury. And again, I have no concerns about that whatsoever because I believe he's going to be a major contributor for us still. And I predict we'll be talking about him a lot in 2024. And keeping in mind that he is now our lone poster child in terms of academy progression into the first team, which is really important when you spend as much money as Aston Villa is on young talent. You have to prove to them that there is opportunity at the top level. Irritating issue. What exactly is a handball anymore? Can you tell me? Because I have no idea. Like, for example, imagine your teammate kicks the ball off both of your arms in the penalty area, maybe it's not giving you an advantage, maybe it's not taking an advantage away from your opponent, but if it hits both arms, why can't that just be an indirect free kick right there from that spot? In fact, why can't all handballs, whether it hits the shoulder or the arm or the sleeve, natural, unnatural, blah, 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 all of them, just make them indirect and give all of them, and then we'll know, well, that's a handball because we don't know. Developing issue, I think it's becoming abundantly clear the type of player I'm hoping we're looking at for either the January window or beyond. And firstly, with all these low block teams that are showing up at Villa Park, a technically gifted connector type who can complement Douglas Louise. So if you shut him down, you've got another option in midfield, maybe a classic 10 type, gifted in the tight spaces. That's what we need. And I don't know if Nicolo Zaniolo or Musa Diaby, who like to play in those roles, are necessarily of the right profile. And then a player who can either complement, challenge, or upgrade on Maddie Cash would be a really good thing. A very high percentage passer, really good pace would be awesome. And somebody who is excellent on the dribble who can maybe even play as a right winger. I'd be shocked if those types of players weren't being looked at by the higher. Just before we get to the top three, 24-7 Services just came back from completing a beautiful job at a local university gymnasium. Speaking of gorgeous Victorian architecture, but this was a really difficult job because of the access to the ceiling. And 24-7 has these two master decorators, like elite, talented, Premier League-level decorators named Jay and Naughty, both huge Villa fans. Now, if you had hired somebody else that didn't have the safety and health certifications that 24-7 does, well, they might have brought in heavy machinery to access the ceiling, and that machine would have gone through the floor because the floor wasn't in great shape, and that could have led to serious injury. So you got to hire the right people that have the right certifications that will get the job done beautifully, of course, and at a fair price. And by the way, Paul Hadsaker is really excited because he's going to Old Trafford on Boxing Day. When it's time for your job, hire the right people. You know what to do with these phone numbers. Big issue number three, Villa Vard. There were a couple of very contentious moments in this game requiring the video assistant referee and they got under a lot of people's skins, including mine. The first one was early, involving Ollie Watkins, who for the second time this season was straight-arm shoved while in the act of trying an attempt on target. The other time was at Wolves. You'll recall he was in the act of shooting when he got straight-arm shoved in the back. And when you are even the least bit off-balanced, which you are when you're shooting, even the slightest touch can deny that opportunity from happening. And this is why I cannot understand when you're going up for a header and you get shoved in the back, denying you the chance to make connection and test the goalkeeper. How on earth is that not a foul? And considering how early it was in the game, Villa get that opportunity from the penalty spot and score? We're talking about a completely different game here. But it was the decision to disallow Leon Bailey's goal in the second half that really got under my skin and why this could have been the number one moment from the game because we all know how good Villa is when they score first, especially at home. John Brooks, who is normally our good luck charm when he referees Villa's games, did us no favors as the video assistant referee in this match, including sending Anthony Taylor to the screen 
to have a look initially at Jacob Ramsey clamping on to the goalkeeper's arm, even though Ramsey himself was being held by a defender. I get that goalkeepers have amnesty in their own six-yard box. I have no problem with that. What I do take extreme issue with is the definition of singular phase of play versus second phase of play. And this is where I think Unai Emery was furious and rarely do we see him go after a fourth official and berate him the way he did after this decision. But I don't think this had anything to do with Jacob Ramsey being tangled up with the goalkeeper. It's the definition of when does the phase of play change? Because after the keeper flaps at it, there were technically two changes of possession. And yes, they were very quick. But the Sheffield United defender has the ball at his feet and he has time. He can release a teammate and get out of the 18-yard box. And what does he do? He plays it directly to Ollie Watkins. It's not like Ollie Watkins closed him right down and pinched the ball away from him. No, he had time. He had a full beat and he passes it right to his opponent. How on earth can you say that that is all part of the same phase of play. How far back are we re-refereeing games now? I would not at all be surprised to hear Howard Webb come out and comment on this moment, possibly even in favor of Aston Villa, because it's a very murky area of the laws and it needs to be way more concise. And it's not just that the goal was chalked off and Villa's lead taken away, it's how that affected their mentality right after that. And this is what Unai Emery was talking about after the game. Speaking of game IQ, he stopped short of publicly disagreeing with the decision to disallow the goal, but he said his team lost control of the game after that decision, which led to a couple of pretty critical moments for Sheffield United. And of all the things that I really am so impressed by with Unai Emery, it's just how he can read the game and understand the nuance of a change in dynamic like he does. Big moment number two, Zen-like, Zaniolo. What have I been saying about the big lad in the past couple of shows? That no matter the circumstances of the game, he just does not seem to get phased, fussed, or rattled. And that's now two games where he's helped us earn a crucial point Sandwiched in between was the trip to Brentford where he had a very effective 19 minutes, helped earn the corner that got us the game-winning goal. And when we needed somebody the most to step up and come up with the goods, he goes and wins a duel against a central defender while a goalkeeper is bearing down on him as well. It is not straightforward. It is not easy at all, but he makes it look that way. And this is where having six foot two or bigger forwards in games like this really comes in handy. What a ball by Douglas Louise again. And without being able to look into his brain directly, we'll never know whether he intended for the ball to work out that way or whether this was just a hopeful delivery at a desperate point in the match. But the ball he plays is there for Zaniola to attack and get. He teases out the goalkeeper, which is critical in how things turned out. And Fodderingham had a couple where he flapped at like this. And then Nicolo Zaniolo just wanted it more. And after he scored, once again, his celebration made him look like he'd done it a million times, even though that was his first Premier League goal and in front of the whole 10 to boot. After that, just like after the Alex Moreno goal at Brentford, Villa had the air of urgency that they now wanted to go on and get the winner. And the number one big moment that defined Villa won, Sheffield United won, Archer, the Avenger. Now, I don't think Cameron Archer came into this game necessarily having a point to prove or seeking retribution or revenge to the club or Unai Emery in particular for selling him on because, frankly, he is playing. He's getting Premier League minutes at Sheffield United and he's proving himself. That's a platform he probably was not going to get with us. And I know there are still lots of Villa fans who wonder... Why didn't we keep him? Or how are his attributes compared with 
John Duran and what both players give us. And unfortunately, the only people that can answer that question are Unai Emery and his hierarchy. But isn't it amazing how football continuously offers up these kinds of storylines? My big question is how does Cameron Archer manage to get into such a wide open pocket of space without anybody contesting him when the ball finally arrives? I mean, I know it's part of his gift to sneakily sidle into those pockets of space where defenders aren't. But his big gift is how clinical he is when the ball finally does arrive at his feet. Did our defenders switch off? Were they late to react? Certainly the lack of continuity, like had Diego Carlos and Pau Torres been in that situation, would they have picked up on it? I mean, this is a guy that Villa players are rather familiar with. And I believe in the Premier League, it's probably a combination of both of those factors. And that combination favors the ruthless, which Cameron Archer is. And that's why we earned $18 million for his transfer to Sheffield United at a time when we needed to raise capital to offset some of our spending in the summer. And this was undeniably the number one moment because the first goal is so crucial, especially in games that are shaping up like this one was, and because the goal came in the 87th minute, and I know there's going to be a lot of talk and narrative about the missed opportunity to go first overall in the league, and the fact we couldn't beat the bottom side on our home turf, but on December 22nd, 2023, Aston Villa was in second place in the Premier League only on goal difference with Arsenal. And if you had said that to me a year ago from today, hey, you'll never guess what's going to happen in 365 days, I would have either laughed hysterically in your face or chewed your arm off to make sure that that actually happened. As we tabulate the categories and points that I've been following over the last three seasons, what takes a massive hit is my OCD, as I now have to look at the points earned at Villa Park and see those dropped too, and always wonder, what if this, or what if that? And of course, we do have a minus on the VAR front because it did rule out the Leon Bailey goal. It's amazing what happens when you don't score first, you know. And that's two league games in a row where we've had to come from behind to earn points. Up next, oh, a trip to Old Trafford on Boxing Day. You have no idea how many Manchester United fans I have in my life all ready to call and text if their team beats Villa. But they're also entirely in bits right now. They have no idea how their club is going to get out of this malaise and mediocre phase they're in where they're out of the Champions League and Europa League. And no matter what happens on the 26th, we have to be very thankful about who is leading us and how strategic and cohesive our club is because that will pay off in the end. It always does. And just because you have the largest fan base potentially in the world, well, that doesn't benefit you when things aren't going well because it piles pressure on. And it seems like over the past 10 years, when the pressure has mounted at United, reactive decisions are made that are not necessarily strategic. I just have this gut feeling that we will see Pau Torres and Diego Carlos back together again at center back with Ezri Konza on the right now that Matty Cash is suspended. And how about this? for a big occasion game to mark officially the midway point of the season, if you can believe it. And there is no fixture in the Premier League that I would love to win more than this one on Boxing Day. In fact, if you offered me up a draw at home with Sheffield United to end the winning streak, but you also get a win at Old Trafford, obviously, I would take that in a heartbeat. And United have some injury issues of their own, especially on the back line. No Lindelof, no Maguire, no Martinez, no Martial, Mount, or Casemiro. And Manchester United has three games between fixture 
we have an extra day's rest because they are playing against West Ham United at the time that I'm recording this. So just like I said when Manchester City came around and they had some absences through injury and suspension, sometimes those games come around at a good time. I'm telling you, I think this game is coming around at a good time. Well, that's it. The final Holy Trinity show before Christmas. And as I've said before on this show and throughout my life, Christmas and the festive period and Aston Villa are inextricably connected for me. I can't have one without the other, whether that means getting Villa-themed gifts or Sabudio gear or just all the fixtures you get to watch around the festive period. I cannot associate one without the other, and now we have this big occasion, big opportunity outing against Manchester United on Boxing Day, which could make the festive period even sweeter for us Villa fans. To you and yours, from me and mine, I want to wish you the merriest, happiest, most peaceful and joyous Christmas of all time. And of course, and as always, up the mighty Philip.